Welcome to our introductory discussion of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a person that is more fundamental for our sense of self than just about anybody. We can ask the question in relation to this, the uh, selection we've got, which is a, a long portion from his book on education called Emile, uh, The Profession of Faith of the Savoyard Vicar. And here he raises the whole issue of religion. And in general, Rousseau is raising the question of what it means to become authentically yourself. Now we might want to ask, hmm, do we still like that language of authenticity? Does it still make sense to us? But certainly for many modern centuries, the search for the authentic self, well, at least since the Enlightenment, has been the goal. And so we ask, what understanding of God encourages the development of our authentic self? Is the God of, of Christianity understood as revealed by dogmas? Is that some kind of a theology that is inimical to developing who we really, really are deep down? Uh, or is this, or is atheism? Is that the way to go? That wasn't Rousseau's solution. So we want to think about our picture of reality. What is the nature of um, what is? How, do, how does that affect our sense of who we are and what we can become? Rousseau was born in 1712 in the Republic of Geneva, the Calvinist Republic, the Huguenot Republic of Gen Geneva. That is, uh, we, we've touched on this at the very beginning of the semester with, with Luther and the Reformation. Um, Calvin, of course, set up a, a theocracy in Geneva, a kind of a totalitarian system where the city council, as it were, is responsible for policing the morals kind of minutely of, of the people. And Rousseau imbibed that. He didn't, he always, or, or almost always, considered himself proudly a citizen of Geneva. He often signed his works that way. And that made him different from other uh, leading figures of the Enlightenment because he comes from this Protestant background as opposed to the leading edge of Enlightenment, of course, comes from France. And the, that's a Catholic country, even though Voltaire and these others are struggling mightily against the Catholic Church. They, they're educated, a lot of them by Jesuits, for instance, they come out of that world. And it's a different set of presuppositions than the ones that uh, Rousseau emerges with. And that's something worth keeping in mind. That's part of why we can say, well, you know, if there's going to be a figure who's going to be contradictory, it'll be Rousseau. Well, that's part of it. He's an enlightened figure who comes out of Calvinist Geneva. All right. But that's what we want to think about is these contradictions that, that Rousseau exemplifies, because we're going to have, in the last few sessions of the semester, a shift, a, a slow shift into what enlightenment kind of turns into, uh, which is romanticism. And the figure that, that is responsible for somehow keeping enlightenment and romanticism or, or, or forming that nexus, generating it, is, is Rousseau. We're obviously still romantic in some general sense. That's, that's our sense. And so Rousseau as a proto-romantic is going to be right there. And yet he's still enlightenment. He still champions reason over the old, and this is the standard enlightenment line, over the um, old claims of privilege of the ancien regime. He's a Republican, obviously, in that small little R sense of, of, of being against uh, monarchical rule and so on. So he's, he's got these contradictions in himself, but we will also want to take a, a look again at, at Voltaire, because th th these two relate to each other, and Voltaire um, embodies con contradict some contradictions of its own. And so that's part of what I would like us to think about, is that the Enlightenment, it's clearly a project of saying reason replaces tradition. Reason replaces privilege, aristocracy. Uh, all the old claims must give way in the light of a publicly available rationality. That's the Enlightenment line. It's still our dominant uh, sense of things now. 
even though we're also romantic again. So it's, it's all kind of kept together. If we can somehow understand the contradictory poses of both Voltaire and uh, Rousseau, maybe we'll find it isn't contradictory. Maybe there's something about enlightenment we haven't understood that reason put forward as the bright day has to bring along uh, some kind of corrective with itself. I don't know, I'm, I'm just putting it out there because it's just noted. We do see that Rousseau is somehow an enlightened, enlightened philosophe, right? One of these French-speaking philosophers, intellectuals, and yet he creates something that looks like a reaction against the enlightenment in the Romantic um, movement. Voltaire dies uh, a few weeks before Rousseau does in 1778. Voltaire, in 1755, is entering a period of, of personal crisis, and he write, and then the Lisbon earthquake occurs, and he writes a poem on the Lisbon earthquake, and he says, so this is one of the contradictions, it seems. Voltaire, who embodies, I mean, that's the man who embodies um, the Enlightenment, he turns against the early modern rationalist philosophy. This is summed up in Leibniz, not completely fairly, but he's saying, look at the death, all of that carnage in Lisbon. Rationality, which is the banner he's been flying, should, says it all should make sense. And he, he's looking at the death and he's saying, it doesn't make sense. Evil exists. It's incomprehensible. I'm just going to take care of suffering humanity. Rousseau responds to the poem of Voltaire and says, you're betraying basically enlightenment ideals. So now that's an interesting moment in the history of enlightenment. Rousseau is attacking Voltaire, is betraying the light of reason. Rousseau is very committed to deism. Voltaire is also a deist. So here it is, a, an internal fight, again, a source of contradiction. Deism is that form of kind of Christianity, it certainly stems from Christianity, um, of taking the book of nature and setting it over against the book of scripture. Now, it's an old patristic that is um, from the early ages of the Christian church, the era of the fathers of the church, that you can read the, um, the goodness of God, you can read the wisdom of God, from the book of scripture, the Bible, and from the book of nature. What happens when Newton comes on the scene? He makes everything seem so lucid with his mechanical system, where with gravity, with the laws of motion, this is, that's the moment, I mean, Newton is, is, is incomparable. He, without him, there's no enlightenment, right? People say, look at that, what he's done. He's shown us how the world works. He's connected the movement of the stars with the movement um, movements on the earth it, that's not the way anybody had seen it before and now everybody thinks well we can actually understand the mind of God and it was it was put that way most of the early modern uh, thinkers the the great heroes of the scientific revolution they were pious Christians most of them and even into the Enlightenment most of them were still believers of some sort and that's where we get deism that is we have to understand there's a shift from thinking there's a book of nature and a book of scripture. And then as time goes on, people say, well, you know, Newton has shown us we can read, if we study, uh, experiment, explore enough of nature, we can get to the mind of God by our reason. And that's how we shift from kind of a dogmatic Christianity to a deist Christianity. So it's a natural religion, a rational religion over against a revealed religion. And that's really, so just as a, is the introduction to this selection we've got. That's what the Savoyard vicar is arguing for. This Catholic priest is this deist. And, and for Rousseau, that's not contradictory. They, they, these Enlightenment thinkers did not, a lot of them, most of them, didn't think of themselves as, as kind of pulling one over on the religious people. They were religious in this rationalist way, and they thought this is what it was all about. The Bible really, this is what Newton has shown us a more, if, uh, effective way of getting at the reality of things. Okay, so he's a passionate deist, Rousseau is. He, he believes in the existence of God, no question. He believes in the existence of providence, no question. Voltaire, also a deist, believes in the existence of God, not as 
not as uh, confidently, but he's, he rejects providence after the Lisbon earthquake. And that's then his response to Rousseau is to write Candide, where he says, it, it, which is a very just, it, it's, it's a very moving, powerful, cri de coeur about suffering humanity. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And for those of us who are Christian believers, I think we would want to see a, a very prophetic voice a memory of the victims there in, in Voltaire. It's very beautiful and very painful. Okay, so there's that's a contradiction that Voltaire seems to be uh, casting off some of the basic commitments of enlightenment and Rousseau is somehow standing up for them. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. Um, Rousseau was coming out of Geneva. He's just naturally pious. Some of us know what that means, right? You, you just, some people are kind of religious and others temperamentally and others aren't. Well, he was temperamentally religious. But then he combined that, or, or the enlightenment got melded in his mind with this. So he was very fervent in his deism. And he believed in, in the operations of providence, whereas Voltaire is saying, this is not the best of all possible worlds, optimism. Um, and I can't see any intelligibility here at all. Actually, I don't see God's hand in this. And Rousseau wants to hold on to that. He was therefore, of course, not only skeptical of the skeptical deists, like Voltaire, but he certainly had a problem with the atheists, which were not the majority of the Enlightenment uh, movement, but Diderot, uh, the editor of the Encyclopédie, the great product of the Encyclopédia, he was one of the atheists. There were a few others. And early on, Rousseau and Tico were, were friends. Uh, I don't like the ad hominem things, but it is worth noting because Rousseau does make his own life a subject uh, for reflection, and that's been part of his effect. His confessions were meant to be a res uh, to play off of the confessions of Augustine, and it's just a very different kind of operation. And I think it's safe to say Rousseau is displays narcissistic tendencies. And that's that's worth thinking about because if we have, as Christopher Lash called it, a culture of nice narcissism, part of that might go back to Rousseau. Again, not as an ad hominem, but it doesn't matter the ideas that he puts forward. Um, so he didn't have, he couldn't, he often broke with his friends, uh, Diderot, Hume, Voltaire, it just, there were lots of breaks in his life and that's not usually a good sign. Okay, so he, was a, like Ben Franklin, he was mistreated as an apprentice and he flees that situation when he's 15. He leaves Geneva. He goes to neighboring Savoy and he turns to the uh, care of a Catholic priest. That's, it's a Catholic uh, province or kingdom. And that priest introduces him to the Madame de Vachon. And that's the most important female presence in Rousseau's life. His own mother died uh, as a result of complications in giving birth to Rousseau. Uh, he called, Rousseau called Madame de Foron, uh, Maman, the Mama, a mother. And um, so he was in her care from 15, within five years, she was 14 years older. Within five years, she had made him her lover, one of her lovers. She was a Catholic part of, she was getting a stipend to, to bring uh, Protestants into the Catholic church. I, it's a very odd kind of setup, but that's part of the complicated psychology and development. And Rousseau would say uh, that that project of finding his authentic self, I mean, things are messy. Okay, so he's known for a lot of things. Music was, was a, a great passion of his life and he spent time developing a music notation system and all that. He wrote the articles on music, a lot of the articles on music for the encyclopedia. But as far as we're concerned, we want to concentrate on his literary breakthrough and that started in 1750 when he got that notice from that provincial academy of Dijon. Um, whether the progress of the arts and the letters have led to uh, moral progress. And his response to that essay contest, his submission, uh, was like a thunderbolt, a lightning bolt, and into the uh, progressive, confident 
Enlightenment age. The triumph of the Enlightenment was just beginning at this point. And right there, uh, Rousseau is saying, no, no. My answer to this is no. Progress in the arts and sciences has led, in fact, to moral decadence. And that, that made his name. Everybody said, and there's again that contradiction, all of the Enlightenment uh, enthusiasts were saying, I, this is really great stuff. It's really important stuff that, that uh, Rousseau is doing. So maybe the Enlightenment had, had more resources for containing contradictions than we might usually credit it with. Okay, so in 1754, he returns. I, <clears throat> so he converts to Catholicism with Madame de Fafon. He returns to Geneva in 1754, reconverts to Calvinism. Um, that's part of a condition of, of citizenship, obviously, in, in Geneva as a theocracy. In 1755, he writes a second discourse. So that first one, the first discourse, we get the second discourse on inequality, on the origins of inequality. And here he's launching into a, something very, a very important deepening of his analysis from the first discourse. It's anti-commercial. It's a it's a, an attack on private property. That the ownership of, of property is in fact one of the reasons that we've got the moral decadence that we've got coming from cultural progress. And here he makes the distinction between the amour propre and amour de soi. That is, this love of self, as in in his use of the terms, amour propre is to um, love to get your self-image as reflected in the uh, esteem of others. It's a form of alienated uh, selfhood. So that, again, the, this quest for the authentic self, you, you, if he's basically saying uh, honor and all of that, that's a fool's game. You're saying, my sense of self depends on how, what other people think of me. And he's saying that's corrupt. That's society corrupting your interiority. Instead, we should just have this, this basic love of self, which is the root of self-preservation, this natural self-love. And he wants to get back to the natural. And this is connected to his sense that of, of passionate and um, pious, if one can use the term, deism. He believes, and we, he shows this in his disagreement with Voltaire, that the evil of this world is socially constructed. So there we have another kind of modern sociological theme, the social construction of evil. He believes that humans are innately good and that if, and that, that, that's tied into his piety. He thinks because God is good, it cannot be that humans um, are just saddled with this evil world because of God. Somehow we, by our free abuse of freedom, have made uh, evil come about. And that's, of course, very uh, resonant with kind of standard dogma about the fall. So this is his theodicy. So he's saying society has corrupted us. We, by getting together and owning property and coming into cities and, and finding ourselves not as simple uh, peasants or uh, like the Native American in the woods, who, these are the models of, of the natural man for Rousseau something healthier than civilized uh, Europeans who he thinks of as morally decadent, which again is interesting given. So, so he's making an attack on the character of, of his peers. So how do we get out of this mess that, that property ownership and, and uh, social coexistence have, and modern, comfortable, commercial social coexistence have brought about well, he writes or he publishes two books in 1762 that are meant to give a um, remedy for the alienated self of modern European enlightened society. On the social contract, which is his, his interesting take on the social contract theory, which is so um, characteristic of modern political philosophy. It is a social contract that establishes basically a democratic Republican Leviathan. If we think of Hobbes saying we surrender our freedom completely to a monarch who has absolute power, uh, Rousseau has no sympathy for uh, monarch monarchical rule. 
he believes in Republicans, therefore he's a Republican, but he also believes in democratic uh, self-government. That is, the, each of us gives up all of our freedom to the, um, the aggregation or the, the, the community of the whole. So that the sovereign is the people as such. And he makes a distinction between the sovereign and government, which would be an instrument of the sovereign people. And that's an important distinction. And maybe we see it in the Declaration of Independence. It's very important to distinguish between where sovereignty resides and the government, which would be a tool of that. So he's saying the social contract, if we depend on this general will, not my own private self-interest, which is, as we see with Adam Smith, right? Private interest is supposed to give social utility. That's the capitalist idea. For Rousseau, he's saying our authentic self must coincide with the, basically the common good. There must be a coincidence of self-interest and the common good. And that's the way to recover in conditions of modern complexity the natural man, the ideal citizen, is to be trained in this democratic, republican uh, giving over of self to the whole. Now, there, in that book, he talks about being forced to be free, and so there's a lot of dangerous kind of uh, uh, notions involved here. But it, it is this desire for an organic uh, community. So that's one remedy. The other remedy is through education. So our selection of the profession of faith comes from his book, On Education and Heal. It's a part novel, part educational treatise, where the point is to create a self-sufficient individual educate, and this is just foundational for modern ed pedagogical theory, to um, not use tradition at all, just disavow it. He doesn't want books involved in education, he, except Robinson Crusoe. He says, just have them learn from nature. It's very naive in a lot of ways and, and so on, but he certainly is sincere about it. And that's where deism is supposedly very natural. It's a natural is the watchword. Somehow reason and, and the natural are coordinated completely. In his mind, it is a common conjunction in the Enlightenment, but of course that does help shade off into the uh, romantic reaction, right? The natural being the measure when the, nat when the nature that we're talking about becomes the woods and so on that are unspoiled by commercial activity. Okay, so where the connection with utility, if we want to just kind of, the Enlightenment view of social utility is so basic. Uh, Rousseau, I think, would, would say, well, yes, the greater good of the whole should pre predominate over my private interest. But where he would find a, a real problem with the utilitarianism of, of the Enlightenment as a, as a mainstream movement, it is commercial. Uh, and he would definitely find that low and not noble, and in fact, degrading and corrupting. Okay, so these, the social contract leads is one of the most important uh, bases for the French Revolution. It, it's kind of an impetus. And here we want to bring us back to the beginning with, with Voltaire. The revolution, the French Revolution, thinks of itself as heir to both of these men. And when the Pantheon, which is this new a monument to the heroes of the revolution uh, is created. Both of these men are disinterred in turn in different phases of the revolution. In 1791, uh, tens of thousands of people line the streets as the body of Voltaire is put in the Pantheon. And then three years later, with the terror and all that, uh, the, the body of Rousseau, with tens of thousands lining the streets, is interred in the Pantheon. So again, these it's just... Enlightenment going into revolution and romanticism, it's all here somehow, if we can kind of think it through. To wrap up, after his death, two important works are published, The Reveries of the Solitary Walker, another solution to the problem of corruption of self, the alienation of self by modern uh, commercial society. And there he talks about, in these two, there's a form of romantic love as fusion of the two lovers. That's obviously very still current, probably not a good vision of love and in the reveries in particular he's talking he's doing that romantic thing of walking out in nature and that's that's becoming a, a way of understanding oneself experiencing oneself not doing anything uh, dolce farmiente not the sweet not doing anything 
And there, when you're not burdened by all of that frenetic activity that most enlightenment thinkers say, you don't do introspection. That's so basic to enlightenment um, thought is that Hume and others would say, don't get lost in yourself. Be sociable. Be out there in the world. Do projects for good. And Rousseau always dissented from that very profoundly in that romantic kind of proto-romantic kind of way. He's saying, I don't want to be social. I want to be solitary. And there he comes back to that. And then he says, one solution, one remedy for uh, commercial corruption is to, to get out into nature and to uh, meditate, to contemplate, to experience what he calls the uh, sentiment de l'existence, the sentiment of existence. And this is going to be important for Kant to somehow this existential um, uh, experience. And for, for, for Rousseau, this, this is part of coming to who one really is. And that's, that's, that's where we, we want to leave Rousseau. How do we, do we believe there is a deeper self, a true self, be beneath, below, above the self that is socially constructed, right? Which may be full of ideologies and corruptions. Do we believe with Rousseau that we can get to a deeper level, our true self? And what theology is best able to um, encourage us to get and uh, empower us to get to that true self? That's the question Rousseau leaves us with, and it is still a question we have to take seriously.